Thank you so much for joining me for another one of our Animal Career Day interviews. It's Keeper Kylie here again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you once again for being kind, for uh, following our new safety guidelines. We have greatly enjoyed seeing you and keeping everybody safe. If you're unable to join us, don't worry, everyone. We still will be doing these videos. And we, in fact, we actually have a second YouTube channel that we upload all of these to. So we will be linking that in the show notes. So go ahead and subscribe to that YouTube channel. So every time we upload one of these videos, uh, you'll see it on Facebook and uh, you'll be able to have those YouTube links. So that's very exciting for us. Well, your donations have been so helpful and it is so thoughtful. Uh, always donate right here on our Facebook page or by going to lionhabitatranch.org. Wow, that's always a lot. It's really hot, guys. It's the middle of summer. And I am not going to begrudge anybody if you don't want to come out right now. I understand it is way too hot and I am feeling it. Started. My guest for today, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you do. My name is Heather Perry and I am an aquatic biologist. I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife there in Basin Species Program. Um, and I started this job uh, about two years ago and I work with a variety of different invasive species. Uh, most things people haven't ever seen before, or they've seen them and they think they're native to California. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, species that have come from different parts of the world. I'm going to talk about ones that came from different parts of North America that are here in California. Ah, yes. So gang, if you guys remember, we've actually talked about this a little bit. You guys have heard from a wildlife rehabber. Um, You've heard from uh, last week when we were talking to another fisheries biologist about, um, you know, how those things can impact the animals that they have to take care of. Those are their jobs. So when we talk about invasive species, what is an invasive species? So an invasive species um, can be quite a few different things. The definition we like to use is an organism that is harmful to the environment. So that means it can harm any other organisms that live there, or it's detrimental to human health. So that's things that could come and cause disease to humans um, or impact humans in a negative way, some way or another. Um, and the other thing is um, an economic impact to us. So there are things that we call benign invasive species that are here. We don't worry about trying to remove them. Um, because they really don't do anything that's considered detrimental. There are invasive species that are quote unquote naturalized. So we don't do anything with them like the European honeybee. We're not gonna get rid of the European honeybee. It's a great um, agricultural benefit to us, um, but it can displace native um, pollinators. So it, we don't consider it an invasive in the way with the invasives that I work with that we actually do try to remove. That makes a lot of sense because um, guys, over the past hundreds of years, we have brought in animals that have kind of found niches here. And um, a lot of these guys you probably see every day not realizing that they never lived here, but they've become so entrenched in our everyday society now with our nature and how nature revolves around them. They might not necessarily do anything harmful. All right. But that makes sense that eh, they're just going to kind of be there or if they might even serve a benefit like the honeybee that was a good uh example but yeah there are some who um can definitely go and cause problems down the line so uh it's really important that the biologists out there are making sure that the habitats that they're taking care of are all encompassing so it is probably a fairly large job um when you have to look at these ripple effects of what can happen i'm sure right you know if you look at one little species and just how that that can really grow how did you kind of fall into this niche? How did you end up working to where you are today? I grew up in Southwest Louisiana between a river and a swamp, and I really fell in love with aquatic ecosystems. Um, so I spent a lot of time fishing with my dad. I spent a lot of time collecting insects, frogs, toads, lizards, anything that my little hands could get a hold of. And then when I was in seventh grade, is that how you old you are when you're 11? Double grade you're in somewhere around there. Um, I had a teacher who required us to do a science collection, and I gravitated towards doing insects. I was really interested in them. In, in them. So I started my first insect collection when I was around 11, and it just kind of 
bloomed from there. Um, and then I kind of went down a path thinking I wanted to be a marine biologist. I really fell in love with sharks when I was really young, um, but that was not gonna work out for me. I'm a little claustrophobic. Um, so being in a wetsuit underneath the ocean is not necessarily something that I particularly enjoy. Um, however, I do still find them interesting. But I ended up in school, um, in college, and I had a professor who kind of introduced me to what field biology was. So that's where you as a biologist get to go out and collect organisms out in the field or do, you know, collect data for them on them. And so I was really interested in that because I was like, well, they're going to pay me to be outside and run around the woods or in a creek or a river. And that was kind of my thing that I was already into doing as it was. So but I wasn't really interested in any of the organisms he was showing me. I wasn't really into fish, didn't particularly care for birds or mammals, you know, all the kind of cute fuzzy things. It wasn't my thing. I really still had a really inordinate passion for insects. So I ended up in grad school and I had my advisor then said, if you want to have a job where you can get paid to collect insects and use them as a tool to understand water quality and how that impacts human use, you can do that. So that's what I did. I went to graduate school and I became an aquatic biologist and I used insects as a tool to determine how humans could use water for different types of recreation. Fast forward into that, working with invertebrates that are aquatic, you end up kind of working with invasive species at some point in time. Um, and so when I worked for a regulatory agency in Texas, um, zebra mussels were something that started to come into the state in the, I think like 2009. Those are a direct impact upon water quality. So it was what I'm really interested in. They collapse food chains, they overfilter water, so they take out all the good stuff, all the plant and the microorganisms that are in there that other organisms feed off of. Because they have no natural predators in the United States, their populations just explode. And so there's, they can just really collapse the ecosystem really quickly. So those things like the sturgeon and the trout and the salmon that we work really hard here in California to protect, um, they can collapse the food webs that those fish actually feed on. Um, and so while not necessarily part of my job to protect those fish, um, the fact that I work with trying to keep those organisms out of areas where these fish are present means that I work directly with people who work on threatened and endangered animals while I'm working to remove invasive species. Right. Wow. And you don't think about an animal being, we tend to think of it in our heads, guys, in, invasive tends to seem like it's bad, like they're attacking things, they're coming. They're not. They're doing what mussels do. They're filtering the water, but they're doing it very, very well. And there's a lot of them and they keep spreading and those guys filter water very well. And so those are the kind of things that we, we tend to gloss over because um, we think of something being invasive. It's, it's bad and it's coming after you and it's like this green goo that's going to slowly take over the world. Uh, it's not and it's things like this, but um, again, it's the ripple effect we talked about. So these little guys are collapsing food webs. They're taking the food that other animals need. So that is kind of um, a small little step in this, in this chain, a small little link in this chain. That is pretty impressive. All right. So what kind of education and certifications, if there's something that um, kids uh, can kind of look into as an offshoot outside of college um, or outside of school, what are some education certifications that really would be helpful and what kids should kind of start looking into if they wanted to go into um, this, this field in general? So I have a bachelor's degree um, and with a bachelor's degree, you can start off with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife as a scientific aid. We only require that you have, I believe, like 10 hours of science courses, which is usually two classes with the lab. Um, and then you can start to get experience that way um, as a scientist working out in the field, collecting data on different projects you can work with, a variety of different groups, wildlife groups, fisheries branch, um, I work in the habitat conservation branch. Um, so there's jobs like that that you can get. More in, um, scientists that tend to work for us tend to have more advanced degrees. So I have both a master's degree and a PhD in biology. Um, I would not necessarily recommend you get a PhD. A master's degree is probably sufficient for the type of work that we do. Um, it gives you a lot of experience with learning how to 
implement sampling plans, how to come up with research projects. Uh, one thing that you do not learn in school, at least I didn't, um, was how to write like a scientist. Writing like a scientist is completely different from writing in your English class. Um, and so having a master's degree really kind of helps you hone those kind of skills. And that's an important part for us because we do write a lot of biological analyses. We write uh, reports to go to legislators or we publish papers on uh, data that we have or you know, research that we've done. So having that kind of skill is really important. Additional types of certifications um, there, for example, um, I have the ability to go and get certified in identifying aquatic authentic macroinvertebrates. That's through a, a society called the Society for Freshwater Scientists. Um, you can do that, but that's only applicable if you're going to be doing taxonomic work, like sitting down identifying insects or identifying other invertebrates. Um, and so most of the training that you would need would probably come through either on the job learning or it would come through um, doing an advanced degree, which for the most part, most of us have some kind of advanced degree. There are very few people that have uh, just field experience or work experience. It can be done, but you're going to probably spend a lot more time as a technician. And not that that's a bad thing. You can get a lot of experience that way. But um, if you kind of want to come out and get full-time employment fairly quickly, because um, these other types of jobs are generally seasonal, um, then having an advanced degree is probably the way you want to go with that. Um, and uh, most people start thinking about how much is college going to cost. Um, with a lot of advanced degrees, if you go into a program, you can get your um, school paid for if you work at school, either as research scientists in a lab or you teach at school. There are some different ways you can go about it. You don't just have to get a scholarship. You can go about it a couple different ways to get your graduate education paid for or subsidized. So you don't have to go into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt to do this. Um, it can be done a couple of different ways. That is important to talk about. Yeah, don't, the price of school guys is terrifying. I understand it, especially if you do want to work in fields like ours. <laughs> I get it. I really do guys. Um, so, <laughs> But by understanding it early, you can start to form those plans. So that is some really good advice. That there are roadmaps out there and there's people who have the experience too. So go out and talk to uh, people who do this for a living and uh, they, can, they can kind of help with that as well. So the other thing I just thought about, um, if you work for a regulatory agency, like when I was in Texas, I worked for this uh, city of Austin's Watershed Protection Department. Um, there were people who I worked with who only had undergraduate degrees. The city would pay them to go and get a master's degree. It wouldn't pay for everything, but it would offset the cost. So there are some other methods to do it. If you get a permanent job, you can find other funding in different ways. Don't always think about the college route, going to financial aid person as being the only way you can do this. There are definitely other options you can choose. Yep, so that is a very good point as well. If you look into some of these options, work might pay for it too. So that is very good information to know. Um, and again, if you guys do have questions about this, uh, feel free to reach out and we can try and get some of that information to you guys if there's something more specific that you're looking for. But overall, that's really good advice that a lot of times if you guys are looking into some of these um, you know, experiences long-term, there's probably gonna be some benefits to it. And that is a really good one to point out. So why don't I go ahead and talk about what does your daily life look like? What does, what does a regular day look like? Cause I have a feeling some of it is probably gonna be meetings and desks and paperwork. Uh, but then what does, what does a really cool day look like when you get to go and do something that's a little bit out of the norm? So my general job is I sit in an office. <laughs> um, the other thing about getting an advanced degree, um, like a PhD, means you get put into situations where you generally get stuck behind a desk, um, writing reports and doing a bunch of other stuff because you become a little bit too expensive to put out in the field anymore. So I do uh, cherish the time I get to go run around outside um, and be in the sunshine and hang out with other people. But most of the time right now, I'm sitting in front of a computer. Uh, I do a lot of data entry. We have part of since I work with these um, invasive muscles, they're quagga and zebra muscles we have here in California. One of the things that's very important to them is water quality. So I spend a lot of time dealing with either gathering water quality data, entering water quality data, looking at uh, 
the calcium level because it's required for the, their process of making shells. Um, so really low calcium, they're not going to be able to survive in water that has a certain level of calcium. Um, and there's some other factors that go along with that. But because these things are not mobile on their own, they don't have legs, they require some method of movement. And for us, that tends to be watercraft. So things like people who own private boats, they move around from one lake to another. Uh, they can pick up these microscopic forms or the adults that can be attached to uh, their boats, and then they can be transferred to different water bodies throughout the state. So I look at the risk factors of what kind of recreation happens on those lakes, um, what their water chemistry is, if there's any other, you know, are they getting water from somewhere else? Because in the state of California, we move water around a lot, pipelines and such to different reservoirs. So there can be different methods for how these mussels, whether they're the larval form or the adults, can get moved from one place to the other. So I spend a lot of time doing that. I am in charge of training all of our new hires. So I get to go out and show people how to do plankton toes, which we use these really fancy nets. They can collect the larval stages um, that are suspended in the water column. I also show them how to use um, some things we call hesterdenes or type of artificial substrate that we put in the water. These particular mussels are very similar to marine mussels, even though they live in freshwater, they have the ability to attach to substrates. And so if you can put out something that, that they can attach to, that's long term in the water, you can go back out and look and see if there are mussels present um, over a period of time. And I train them how to do water quality sampling. Um, that's what I do for mussels. I get to go out and do some snail work as well. So we go out and do surveys for some of the basic snails that we have. And in the future, I will probably be going out and doing some bullfrog removal because um, I'm working now with removal of those frogs in the state. They are not native to California. Um, and so we're going to be working with uh, local landowners um, to remove bullfrogs in habitat that's suited for them um, because they tend to eat our native amphibians and reptiles and there's nothing here that eats them. So that's kind of some new things that I'm going to be doing soon, but most of my work is spent with how do you get rid of stuff. So I spend a lot of time talking to people how to not make good habitat for them or how to remove them from their property. Yes. Um, and I do want to go and point out again, guys, a lot of this is coming down to our everyday stuff. These scientists are doing amazing work out there. You, you just heard the amount of data and work that goes into it. And a lot of the times it's still going to come down to what you and I do. So this is a really good opportunity to understand that when it comes to some of these species, when it comes to a lot of these species, our habits will ultimately be a huge factor in this. So this is something, guys, where you guys can become wildlife warriors and, and still go and figure that maybe this isn't the career field for you. That's fine. But it's still really great knowledge to take with you. But if this is something that's kind of ringing a bell where you're like, I really want to go and help protect the land that I love. I love going to the lake. I love going to the river. I love going fishing uh, with my family every weekend then this is a great way that you can start realizing that there is a place out there for you to go and help save the world. And I think that is pretty darn cool. Yes, it probably involves a lot of data, but remember what we heard last week, that data is what does stuff. Yes, looking at fish and microscopes and larvae and all that is really cool. Being in a lab is awesome but you gotta do stuff with it. And these are the people who make that happen. So you gotta log the data, you gotta go and print those papers. They gotta get to people, politicians' desks before they can go and make an impact. So that's why these jobs are really important um, because as much as we wanna go and trucking around swamps in our boots, you gotta go and get the stuff done. And these scientists get work done and they are awesome. And uh, whether or not you wanna do this for a living, give them a big thumbs up, guys. These guys work really, really hard to protect our water every day. It's pretty awesome. All right, hardest question for everyone out there, and it is always, what is your favorite animal? Oh, man. So I would probably have to say Caddisflies are probably my favorite, which is an aquatic insect that no one ever knows what I'm talking about. They're related to butterflies and moths. Um, they, the larvae live in water and they can spin silk and they can build little houses out of plant material or rocks. 
um, fly fishermen fly ties to look like the adults. Um, but if you want to know my favorite animal that most people probably know what it looks like, uh, I have a real thing for sharks. Um, pretty much any of them, I'm obsessed with them. <laughs> so, but yeah, so those are probably the top two. But I pretty much like if it's, you know, walking and crawling, I pretty much like it. <laughs> so, what is a common misconception about your job? I think what's a really common misconception is there are not a lot of females that are in science. Um, I think. Um, that's definitely starting to change. Um, when I went to graduate school, the lab that I was in was predominantly female. We probably had one or two guys in our lab out of, you know, 15 people. Um, so I think that that's kind of becoming more the norm now to start seeing, uh, a lot more females in this position. Um, and currently right now, the program that I work in, we have, there's like eight of us the work in the office that we're in, and there's only two guys out of it. So my program manager is a female, so I kind of like the fact that we're seeing a lot more females spread out. Not only are we scientists, but we're also in positions of, of leadership as well, running programs and directors of departments. And so it's kind of nice to kind of get to see them. It wasn't always that way <laughs> at all. You know, I mean, there's always those women you run into who are like, I was the first woman to ever do this or to be in here. So I think that's, all, that's always nice to see now. We like to get dirty too. I don't have any problem being knee deep in mud, smelling like dead fish or, you know. So I, I think that's always the idea is that it's not a job for a girl. What is something that no one would expect about your job? I guess there are, there can be times when you realize um, that maybe not everybody really cares about nature the way you um and by that i mean like there are places you know i've had to sample in urban situations before like urban streams and stuff and the amount of trash that just gets left behind um for different things so for example fishing line fishing line is a big problem you know birds get wrapped up in it um so i probably one of the things that we, people might not realize is the amount of trash that we pick up um you know, I pick anytime I'm out near any kind of place where fishing happens, I'm constantly picking up fishing lines, hooks, any kind of additional trash that's, you know, been left behind by somebody else. Um, but that, that, you know, causes a lot of problems, you know, causes habitat issues. Obviously, if something gets wrapped up in it, you know, it could kill an animal. And I don't think I don't think people tend to think about the trash they leave behind, what happens to it. I mean, I think there's a lot of information provided now about you know how much plastic destroys things in the ocean but it happens just as much in fresh water as well um and so i always find that interesting the amount of stuff that gets left behind by people who use nature as a recreational aspect you know whether it's fishing or hunting or you know going out and using their boats or whatever it is um and that some of that stuff can be destructive and how destructive it is and and that they don't think about caring about the place they want to go and recreate. I think that's probably one of the things that's uh, kind of sad to see on a regular basis. You would hope that people would be better about taking care of it, that we all get to share. You know, it's not just their personal lake. Um, and, you know, and you would want for it to be there for everyone else. That's kind of, I think that's probably one of the things that's probably the hardest of my job. And probably the thing that most people probably don't realize is about the kind of trash that we have. Yeah, we, we have this image in our head that we think of field biologists out there, we think of kind of these secluded places out there, maybe wide open marshy lands and things like that. And um, in our heads, they're always this really pristine area and I uh, can confirm from experience just like, yeah, guys, there's, there's a lot out there. Um, and I want to go and, and point this out. Guys, you have heard me talk about this. We live in Las Vegas. Our nearest water source is Lake Mead. And when we get the rains that come down every year, our monsoons, that trash that gets washed down doesn't go away. It has to go somewhere. There's no place called away on a map. When you throw something away, it's not going anywhere. So you guys got to realize that. Um, 
So yeah, that's, that's a hard one. When we go out there to go in, and care for the animals and the habitats that we love, these are environments that we love and we have to go and, and, and see kind of the destruction firsthand. It is a very powerful thing and that can be uh, quite emotional sometimes. Um, what is one of the hardest parts of your job? You know, the physical part of field work can be difficult. Um, some of the places I have to go to are not, you can't just drive up to every place you want to go sample. Um, there's not a road to everywhere. So sometimes you have to backpack in. Sometimes even just going up and down a stream bank can be difficult. Um, you know, they can be pretty steep. Stuff can give way. I've fallen down stream banks before. That's never a fun experience. Uh, walking in these, you know, aquatic habitats, you can trip over stuff. It's, you can't see through the water all the time. So um, it's just, it's really physical. So on top of just trying to get to where you want to go to, carrying the equipment you have in, um, as you mentioned earlier, if it's hot outside, it's kind of miserable to be out, you know, wading in water with basically neoprene waders on if you're shocking things like fish in a hundred and something degree weather, you're basically wearing a wetsuit that's, you know, looks like a pair of overalls. Um, and it can be very hot, you know, when you're doing that. So it can be physically stressful. Um, and, you know, so you have to kind of, you know, stay in good shape. And the older you get, you know, sometimes that, you know, just that wear and tear on your body just becomes really difficult. My knees are not my 20 year old knees anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, you get to go see some really cool places. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't still a job that I wanted to get up every day and go do. Nailed it right there. I love that. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard, guys. Can confirm working outside every day. Um, but it's something where if you are passionate about it, it's it makes it worth it. You know you're making a difference in the world and and it makes it makes sitting there and staring at the data a little bit more worthwhile, you know. It's it's you, the numbers have meaning. So that's something that that can can be there. So, but yeah, I can definitely understand that. So then, what is your favorite part of the job? Um so, I mean, I definitely like my field work, even though, you know, it can be physically difficult. It's still fun. Um, when you generally go out and do field work, you work in a team. So you get to spend a lot of time with your coworkers um, and they basically become like an extended family. And if any of you know what it's like to have brothers and sisters, they can be, you know, they can annoy you. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you all get along and, you know, you, you work as a team at the end, you know, and get get the sampling done or get whatever you're out there trying to do, you get that done. Um, but the other thing that I, I really enjoy um, is I like doing education outreach. This is one of the things that I do a lot of, whether that's, you know, doing interviews like this, or I, I do the Sports Meets Expo every year in Sacramento. Um, I've done lots of summer camps when I was in grad school, I've taught for a long time um, in grad school as well. So I like doing this because I think part of it is you know, I think people think of scientists as these people who live in white coats and they live in some building somewhere and we never access them, we never see them. Um, my job is paid for by the taxpayers of California. So I think it's part of my job to spend a lot of time talking to them about the organisms that we deal with, um, why they're in, you know, what makes an invasive species, why they're bad, all the things that, that my job entails because I need those people to understand that the things that they're doing or the, the money we're asking them to spend on things like for the muscle project that I work on, they're required to get a sticker for their boat that every two years. And so that's technically a tax, but that directly pays for my position and everyone else's position in our group um, and other things, funds our projects, funds you know us to be able to buy equipment and that kind of stuff. Um, but in the long term, that's useful for them because they then are able to recreate in areas that, you know, don't have muscles in them, don't have invasive species they have to worry about being around. So educational outreach is really a big part of my job. And I really think of it as probably other than doing the science part, it's the other biggest part of my job because I see it as probably one of the most important things because I want people to understand why releasing a, a species is bad or why we're trying to remove this invasive species to protect another species. Um, 
So I really enjoy this kind of stuff um, as much as I enjoy going out and getting dirty as well. So I, I, I'm, I'm lucky to have a job that allows me to do both of them. Awesome. Yeah, that is, that is amazing. I love seeing this kind of passion from people because you guys are the ones who are not only on the front lines, but really are making a difference. And, and yes, I love education. This is obviously why I do these things and having that kind of education passion there just makes my heart sing and I love it. So thank you so much for what you do. And hopefully you guys are out there understanding this. Um, if you guys are watching this and you are not in California, fear not there is probably a uh, local water source near you that still needs your help, I guarantee it. Uh, so reach out to your local um, Fish and Wildlife Services. You can reach out to your local um, uh, Forest Service as well, and they can help direct you to those areas. Maybe you guys want to start volunteering now. Um, a lot of those places can take some high school volunteers. So that's something where if you're interested in this, you can still go and, and help out and really start to learn some of this stuff. So if this is kind of resonating with you that you want to go and help make a difference in the world, hey guys, wildlife heroes can be big or small or anywhere in between. And, and the little guys like those caddis flies need us too. So it's important for for everybody. So hopefully you guys learned a little bit in this interview. Um, any final words of wisdom? If there's kids out there who might want to do this for a career field, what, what would you tell them? Um, that I, you know, start doing kind of what I'm doing now when I was three. And I never ever thought that what I did when I was three would be something I'd still be doing decades later. So, you know, don't always think that the natural career paths of being a teacher, not that I'm saying teachers are bad, um, or, you know, being a doctor or a lawyer or something that, you know, or like the typical jobs most people are aware of. If this is something you're interested in, start, you know, figuring out what you like. Um, you know, there's tons of people who can help you, you know, tell you kind of what their career path was. None of us ever take the same way to get here. Um, and, you know, there's tons of these types of jobs and there's volunteer work you can do. There's you know, there's all kinds of different programs. Your teachers should be able to help you figure out who you can get in contact with. When I wanted to go into entomology, my teacher found me someone at a college who was studying entomology. So that's how I got into this. Um, that was the kind of first networking thing I ever had happen for me. So it's kind of interesting. And don't think, you know, that just because, you know, you don't know of a job existing, it doesn't mean one doesn't exist in it. I would have had no idea when I was 10 or 11 that this kind of job existed for me at all. I just happened to run into somebody, somebody in a, in a college class who said, you really probably would like field biology, but I had no clue. Um, and so if you think it's something you're interested in, now we've got these magic machines, you know, you can get on and Google, does anyone do, you know, whatever. Um, and, and you can find out if there are people doing those types of jobs. Um, and so if something interests you, but you've got, say, like another interest, my niece really likes insects, but she also likes medical stuff. So she's thinking about going into, you know, medical entomology, where she looks at how insects pass disease off to different people, uh, or to, to people. So there's things like that. If there's two things you like, see if there's a way you can marry them. Um, and, you know, and just start asking people and, you know, don't be silent about it. I bug people all the time about stuff. And that's really the way to kind of get people to know who you are. It's just, you know, get in their face and kind of don't let them forget you. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, and so there's tons of like, you know, that she was mentioning, you know, places like the Forest Service takes high school students out here in California, does work with them in the summer. It's a, it's a program you can get into. There's multiple different things um, you can do if this is what you're interested in. And you might realize you don't like it. That's the other thing. You know, you get to college and you have this idea of I want to be a whatever I want to go to school for. And you realize you get in there and you're like, I don't like this at all. I really thought I was going to be a veterinarian. And I worked in a vet clinic and I realized I don't want to be a doctor. I was way better at being a nurse. And I enjoyed that part of it better than having to do anything else. Um, so, but there are different, you know, aspects to that, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I was fortunate to have a job that I really enjoyed. And there's tons of volunteer stuff um, out here in California. We have with the Forest Service, because I helped start the program. 
and amphibian watch. You can do stuff through iNaturalist and figure out, you know, if there are different types of volunteer programs that way as well. And see if there's something that, you know, kind of clicks with you if you aren't 100% sure what you might like. Nailed it again. Absolutely, guys. Um, and I say it every video. If you have questions, ask. Because while I might not have the answer, guys, I have so lucky to have such an amazing support network to put me in touch with people like Heather over here who can go and, and reach out. And I promise you, we will find people who have answers somewhere out there. So ask those questions, get involved, um, and we are always happy to go and help support the, the future of, of biologists to come up. If you guys are interested in this, let us know and we're more than happy to help give you that information well i think that is just about going to wrap us up guys thank you so much for joining us for another one of our interviews guys keep checking back um, we're going to keep trying to do these interviews as every week as possible um, these guys come out every tuesday however they are only going to come out if i can get interviewees and some of my interviewees are in different time zones across the world right now so that's been a little challenging so bear with me if i end up missing a week i promise it will be worth the wait always so all right um check back later guys again feel free to come and visit us in the ranch when we are open we'd love to see everybody and if not please consider sponsoring an animal donations of course and um and we can't wait to see everybody all right guys i'll check back with you next week want to give one more bye heather bye thanks guys <laughs> bye everyone <laughs> Everybody. Catch you no, next week, everyone. <laughs>